<laughs> so, as I was saying before, um, my topic is being a Catholic in the 21st century. So, I just thought I would break it up a little bit and just um, first have a think about what it means to be a Catholic. Be validly baptised, so I guess that's the first step in coming to the family of God. Um, the second thing is uh, believing and professing the required teachings of the Catholic Church on faith and morals. That is a, that's kind of a big one, I will come back to that. <laughs> um, and thirdly, to participate in the communion of the church by living a sacramental life of obedience and faith. So basically to like receive the sacraments, Eucharist, confession, all of that sort of thing. And, you know, just be part of the family of God and partake. Um, so I guess, yeah, you can be validly baptised and come along to Mass and everything, but what does it mean to be a practising Catholic? Have you guys heard of any of the requirements of being a practising Catholic? Going to Mass, obeying the sacraments, practising the sacraments. Mm. So there's actually five precepts that um, meet the minimum requirements of being a practising Catholic, and I'm sure we all fall within them. <laughs> um, so, um, attending Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation is the first one. Um, the second one is confess your sins at least once a year. I think most of us do that Easter, Advent kind of thing, but then you know, hopefully more regularly. Um, receive the Eucharist at least once a year, at least during the Easter season. Um, Observe all days of fasting and abstinence. So you kind of need to know what the days of fasting and abstinence are. But um, yeah, if, I guess if you are in a Catholic family, you would generally know things like Ash Wednesday and Good Friday and all that sort of thing, Lent. Um, and number five is to help provide for the needs of the church. So financially, and I guess also giving up your time and talents where needed. Um, I think it's fair to say that if you're a cradle Catholic, you're you pretty much already fall within the category of practicing Catholic. I know, I definitely did. <laughs> um, and you know, you just kind of like, whether it's out of habit or um, familial obligation, like, you know, I was living at home when I was younger, right up until I was married. So I was kind of just, you know, there's that, definitely you just go to mass, that's what you do. Um, it felt really bad if I didn't go to mass, which, I always did. It would, I think I remember like one time I was on an overseas holiday. Um, I was like on a Kentucky or something, and like I, the schedule like didn't allow for me to find a mass on the side. I was like, oh, okay, well there's that dis dispensation anyway. But it did feel really weird, like not going to mass. Um, um, so I wanted to know, love, and serve God, and have a relationship with Him and all that. Um, but I just didn't have a properly formed understanding of um, what that meant and how to do this in the Catholic Church. Because um, I guess like without knowing really what the faith is about, um, it's really hard to like understand how to live genuinely, authentically as a Catholic. And um, like, for example, I didn't even know until I was much older that the Eucharist was the body and blood of Christ like you know it's just something that you do that's part of mass and like I think yeah I must have just not been paying attention to my first holy communion classes <laughs> but yeah um so okay being catholic in the 21st century what are some challenges specifically that we're facing now in the 21st century you guys got any thoughts particularly like moral challenges media yeah. Doesn't show the doesn't promote Catholic values. Yeah. So if we practice our Catholic values you get judged to yeah. not accepting society's views. Yeah. It's very countercultural. Yeah. yeah. The media is so bad at like normalizing mm -hmm. everything. Um, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Um, any other thoughts? You guys are quiet. <laughs> the referendums, so, so, uh, yeah. euthanasia, abortion. Yeah. Those yeah. kind of issues. Yeah. So there's definitely this like progressive agenda that's that's happening. You know, all these you know pro-choice like um, 
that sort of thing that pretty much every issue is something that we as Catholics can't agree with. Um, and then if you dissent, it's now the thing we have to worry about is hate speech. So that's what our government is starting to look at now and we should be really concerned as Catholics because, you know, we can't... It's basically if we express our faith um, and the truth, the actual truth, then we have to be worried about being prosecuted for hate speech. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, um, you know, the LGBT um, agenda redefinition of marriage, which has already happened in our country and is happening across many other countries. Um, this new gender ideology that, you know, it's affecting like even the youngest of children. It's really scary. Like me as a parent, I have to be really concerned, like, you know, worried about, you know, what our teachers and things like, you know, saying to my children and that sort of thing. Um, now, like, you know, most of us work, companies are getting these rainbow ticks so uh, my husband's company went through this recently and um, basically you have to show that all your staff are like really pro supportive of the LBG LGBT um, staff and you know like things like you have to turn up in like a shirt that's like one of the rainbow colors and you have to you know that sort of thing and um, so that was that's really hard because um, because it's all about like anti-discrimination um, and of course we don't discriminate you know we we love all people and we don't discriminate against anybody like on any basis um, but yeah if you um, voice any particular things in that respect you know your job is potentially at risk <laughs> um, yeah so that's interesting um, there's like you were saying Donna May, the media like normalization of premarital sex um, normalization of infidelity um, pornography wide availability of birth control that's just like the norm for pretty much every woman <laughs> um, and then that's also leads on to the commoditization of children with new reproductive technologies IVF um, yeah so and then I guess what we were talking about earlier um, religion like if you're a religious person like being boxed as like irrational or anti-science which as Catholics we definitely aren't anti-science um you know you know the whole term religious nuts um and then of course there's the whole drug and alcohol culture um you know like that's just kind of a norm at the moment like always you know the marijuana um, thing was so close you know like you can kind of see people's views on that um, but yeah I guess like in terms of this like binge drinking culture like that's become I guess almost like the the norm in terms of like so, like social gatherings that sort of thing so um, you know we all in a social gathering we all want to feel the need to like be included to feel liked and you know to be cool or whatever but like you know, that's, I guess it's hard when, you know, as Catholics, we're not supposed to go too far with alcohol or, or touch drugs or anything like that. Um, so these are all the problems of the 21st century that we are all facing as young people. And herein lies the problem, because while it might be easy to be a practicing Catholic, like as you can tell, we're pretty much everyone who's a cradle Catholic almost would just fall into that sort of bucket. Um, you know, it's easy to obey the precepts of the church if you, you know, like, you know, well, okay, mostly it's easy to, <laughs> I mean, um, but yeah, given the challenges of what, you know, in the times in which we live, it can be much harder to believe and profess the moral teachings of the church. So that was going back to that second point I originally said. So, you know, that's what we're called to do as Catholics, to believe these moral teachings and profess them so um, you know some of these tougher more sensitive topics like abortion and that sort of thing um, euthanasia like people will pass it off as compassion but you know if we're actually authentically Catholic we need to actually speak in truth and you know profess what our church teaches and that's really hard <laughs> um, so 
this is actually the key though um, to being an authentic Catholic um, in the 21st century, genuine Christian witness. So like witness is, is a really powerful thing. So there's nothing more powerful, attractive and irrefutable than your life as a witness because no one can refute your own story and you know, that this happened to you because of this or you know. Um, and I just wanna to read to you a couple of paragraphs from the Catechism. So this is paragraph, paragraphs 2044 and 2045. The fidelity of the baptized, that is the faithfulness of you and I, is a primordial condition for the pro proclamation of the gospel and for the church's mission in the world. In order that the message of salvation can show the power of its truth and radiance before men, it must be authenticated by the witness of the life of the Christians, which is us. The witness of a Christian life and good works done in a supernatural spirit have great power to draw men to the faith and to God. Because they are members of the body whose head is Christ, Christians contribute to building up the church by, constant, by the constancy of their convictions and their moral lives. The church increases, grows, and develops through the holiness of her faithful, which is how holy we each one, an individual one of us are, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So basically, it, we have to keep growing in holiness until we are like Christ himself. Um, which is a pretty big deal. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's very clear like how powerful um, you know, the witness of our lives are and how important that is to you know, the furtherment of our church. Um, so yeah, basically to be Catholic in the 21st century is really to be part of the church's mission of evangelization. Um, and that is through our witness. Pope Francis says evangelization is the mission of the church not just of a few, but mine, yours, and our mission. And so I guess with that like, kind of overview, I just wanted to share a bit about my journey and how I kind of like progressed, I guess, through like uni work and, you know, where I am now. <laughs> um, so I guess I, I, start, I started off in kind of like a um, fairly sheltered upbringing. I, um, I went to a Christ, little Christian school and um, I only really had Christian or Catholic friends. Um, I was also part of like a community um, where that became like kind of my whole like world and circle of friends and that sort of thing. So I made like I was, I went through, I had like really good friends and good prayer life I'd say. Um, I was leader of youth groups and young adults groups and all of that. So I kind of like just grew up in this like little bubble I didn't like I had friends like who were my school friends or outside of that but I didn't really like invest in those relationships like that bubble was kind of like where you know my everything kind of was um and yeah so towards the end of university that bubble burst <laughs> um there, there was a certain event that happened that um where I basically lost all my friends and I left that youth group and um I was in my second year of uni and I was just like completely lost because I didn't know who I was going to hang out with and I had some friends from my school, um, they were quite secular and um, I changed schools from that small Christian school, I, I moved to schools and then um, yeah, I, my faith wasn't particularly deeply rooted or anything at that point so even though I was like doing all the youth group stuff it was, I guess I'd like stuck to those friends as more of like a social thing that was the main thing that was kind of like keeping keeping me there um, and of course like you know that I had that love for God and everything but I didn't have any understanding of my Catholic faith or you know reasons why you don't do certain things or um, you know so I guess I just it was probably a bad place for me to, <laughs> to kind of just be like let into the world um, with these new secular, secular friends and I was introduced into the party kind of like lifestyle um, I was still attending Mass every Sunday um, and all of confession and all of that so technically I was a practicing Catholic um, but often it would be like 
turn, turning up to mass after a night of partying or something. Um, and my understanding of the Eucharist and like the reverence we should have in receiving the Eucharist and that sort of thing, it was, it was zero, I had no idea. So yeah, looking back, at, not very, it wasn't a very good thing. <laughs> but um, in 2010, I um, secured a graduate role at my dream accounting firm, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and um, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> it was a huge corporate, you know, hundreds of people working there um, with a work hard, play hard um, culture, basically. Um, and yeah, there was constant social events. Um, if there wasn't like team events, um, it would be just Friday night drinks kind of thing. Like you would always be going out and doing things because you work long hours. And so the where like the people that you work with, like there was a lot of young people. So you start off with this graduate kind of group. So I think I started off with about thirty other auditors, and we became really close because we were working all the time together and then we would <coughs> socialize together on the weekends and, and on weeknights and things like that um, at the local bars and things like that. So um, yeah, like all the social events, like even you know the, the ones that were put on by the company itself were heavily like drinking based. <laughs> um, and it was really the only way to like network so um, if you wanted to get yourself on the radar of the managers or the partners or anything like that, that was kind of like a, um, yeah, like the networking environment. And well, at least that's how I justified it of like why I was going to all these events. And I definitely like got sucked into like how, you know, this like the party scene, like I guess I was partying a little bit at uni, but then this work culture was just like next level. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, it wasn't long before I got the reputation of being like someone who would drink a little bit too much. And that reputation was really hard to get rid of. Like even in the following years when I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. Um, yeah, that kind of like, yeah, it definitely sticks. So um, a couple of years after I attended after I'd been working, um, I attended Hearts of Flame at Catholic Summer School. Have any of you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that was amazing for me. I started getting to know my faith for the first time like ever. <laughs> you know, it was just mind blowing that you could actually like find out things about the mass and different teachings of the church. And I didn't even know that we could do that, <laughs> which was kind of like how like clueless I was. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I was in this environment where I met all these people who were really passionate about their faith and you know wanting to learn more and that sort of thing and striving to be holy. And, and for me, that was kind of like my first turning point where I was like, I want to be like that. I want to live like that. But of course, it was like a 10 day summer school and that was like a little Catholic bubble. And I had to go back into the reality of work and, um, you know, <laughs> back, back to PwC where there's that drinking culture and I didn't have any Catholic friends. So I met people at Hearts, but like Auckland is really um, spread out. And I don't think there was anybody except maybe one person who was at my parish. Um, so I didn't really have that like support structure or I couldn't really keep up those friendships. I think what we did for the first um, six months or something was we used to meet up on Friday, a gr small group of us would meet up on the Friday nights to go to Adoration at Sacred Heart in Ponsonby. But, um, you know, slowly, it's a Friday night as well. So I'd be like, oh yeah, I'll go to that. And then I'll go to this party or do this. <laughs> or like, you know, it's, um, there was nothing to really like stop me from, from like that. Um, and yeah, so definitely no like-minded friends in my like close circle of friends. Um, the following year I attended Hearts again and um, the difference was I had been noticing like because of my first encounter at Hearts, I'd been noticing that like I didn't like this culture and I didn't like really being part of it. I was just it's like I was fighting to get out of it, but it was really hard because I was just around, like every single person I was friends with was just in it. 
Um, and so I knew that I needed some sort of like support, like community or something. Um, and during that year, God had been prompting me in a major way, like, do something, do something about it. Like, I didn't know like what it was, but anyway, I attended Hearts again at the end, at the, you know, the following year. And um, it was actually on the drive home from Hearts, we stopped at like a McDonald's or something in a convoy. And I started talking to one of my friends about this idea. I was like, you know, we really need to do something because there's, in like the young, like working world, like there's no support for, for these like youth groups and young adults groups. And there's like nothing that can actually support us. Like we should do something. We should have a way to be able to learn our faith and like all of this, not just once a year at Hearts. And so that's how Catholic Young Professionals was born. So um, yeah, I was, one of the people who started that and because when my friend heard that idea he was like completely on board and we found out that well, he brought a couple of friends and I started attending mass at the cathedral and then I found out oh one of my other friends from PwC was a Catholic and I was like oh well wow. <laughs> so there was a couple of um friends from work and then we were just like this little group and we're like let's let's do something and then as soon as it started, it really felt like there was this like need for something that so many people would come like every week or every month. I think the events were monthly. So yeah, basically a year after that first hearts, um, a year later, I had a flourishing apostolate that I was um, helping to run, um, and my faith was starting to get up, get back on track because we were trying to like get speakers and like learn more about our faith and that sort of thing and you know, topics like, you know, religion and science, how do they go together? And it was the first time I learned like, wow, our faith is completely in line with science and I had no idea. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I, so yeah, basically a year later while I was running CYP and all that, I changed jobs. So finally I had a fresh start. Um, you know, I it was a company that did not have a party culture it didn't really even have a social culture at all <laughs> which is really weird for me but um, yeah it was good because then I was able to get rid of that reputation of you know and then I didn't have those necessarily need to go along to those things because I'd kind of out of that environment those friends and all of that I didn't need to go along to all their parties and things um so the friendships that I developed at um, my second job THL it was a um, more based out of um, friendships with co-workers that were formed in the lunchroom. <laughs> so just actual conversations and, you know, um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. So that obviously takes more time because you only get like a short lunch break, right? Um, and I spent the first couple of years just building relationships. I didn't really even mention my faith too much until, I mean, you know, like you'd say things like, oh yeah, I went to mass or this event or that event but you know it was more it was not like an and I didn't want to be like in their face that um yeah I'm like Catholic and I love being Catholic <laughs> sort of thing because like you know one of you mentioned before like that can kind of scare people off like Alice said that um yeah so um so these relationships I hope I've been there now like six years but um these event they, these relationships eventually like grew into, I think it maybe took two or three years, it grew into friendships that um, we could actually start talking about real things. So it progressed to the point where we were debating abortion, like in the lunchroom, like that sort of thing. Um, but these were people who I was friends with first, and so they knew that I wasn't like this like crazy person, <laughs> you know? Like, um, and they were actually open to hearing my opinions and you know we had differing opinions but it was just really respectful like back and forth which um which i was actually really excited about like for the first time i was genuinely unashamedly catholic um and my friends still accepted me for it so that was quite cool um it felt great but it took a lot of time and it took laying a lot of groundwork um and that groundwork was especially in my own life so around the same time I was introduced to, um, well at Hearts I had a taster of Theology of the Body. Have you guys heard of Theology of the Body? Yeah, um, I know you have done. <laughs> but um, yeah, Theology of the Body was like, 
it was it's just something that's always like uh, I'm like obsessed with theology of the body I can't talk about it enough so I won't even start but, um, but yeah for me um, I had a taste of it back then and then I had an opportunity to go on attend this like six week course like um, my friend Maria Pays like runs these six week courses in Auckland um, and I just happened to like go to this one I think it was called Freedom to Love and um, I, I actually started getting equipped to be able to talk about some of these tougher moral issues um, and that to, you know, just that knowledge, um, you know, growing in knowledge, it was quite um, exciting because, you know, as you know, I didn't really have any background in understanding any church teachings or anything like that. So I kind of went on this rampage of getting to know everything about my faith. So I think it's it's been like three years or something and I've just literally like absorbed everything I can. I'm still absorbing everything I can. So like I started off with Theology of the Body and then I started looking on YouTube and I found Ascension Prese Presents videos, like have you guys seen those with Father Mike Schmitz and back then I think it was just Father Mike Schmitz and now they've got lots of other people but um, I used to like watch his like little five minute videos like all the time, you know, like while I was brushing my teeth or like while I was, you know, in the car or like doing my hair or something, I like just wanted to like learn one more thing about the church and you know like one more thing and it was so exciting. Um, and yeah, like I, I was buying books and reading books, I was I discovered podcasts so like the first podcast that I found that was really cool was um Catholic Answers Live have you guys heard that podcast no um so it's there's like this Catholic Answers is um is this organization in America and they've got all these like Catholic apologists who are amazing and they they separately give talks and write books and all of that but like it's like a show where people can, um, it's on a radio station and people call in and like ask their questions on the faith. So like there might be Protestants like asking like tricky questions about Catholicism or it might just be Catholics who like genuinely don't know like why do we pray for the saints or you know things like that. And I didn't know like so much of the stuff and so like I was every episode like it was like maybe 20 questions per episode and they went into such detail of like they just like knew all these answers off the back of their hand and like um you know they'd quote bible verses and i'm like wow like all this information is there like the church fathers and like I, I my mind was just like being blown like all the time and then i started like listening to talks to like get more in-depth knowledge about the eucharist like dr scott hahn and you know like all these amazing people that like yeah it, it was really exciting for me <laughs> so um yeah like i guess from that point like that's kind of the end of what, you know, my testimony part, portion of this is, but, um, yeah, I guess it's now, like, now I feel like I'm in a, and it's, there's always going to be continual, like, growth and knowledge and learning and everything, like, it's a daily basis until we get to heaven, basically, but, um, yeah, like, I think I feel a lot more confident in my faith, and that has helped me so much in my actual relationship with Jesus because like if you remember earlier on in my life I was trying to have that relationship with God and like it was you know like I would try and pray or read the Bible but like I still felt really disconnected but like I think what I love about the Catholic faith is that we're it's like head and heart like it's we're reasonable like everything that you want to find an answer to there's a, a reasonable like explanation everything just makes sense like it's really mind-blowing like how it all fits together all the different teachings like fit together and especially if you do theology of the body um yeah it's really cool so um i just wanted to share with you i think i've got seven <laughs> practical tips so i'll just like read them out quickly um yeah just to see if they if they help you but um kind of like what i talked about during my testimony but yeah the first one is impressions last. <laughs> so um, how you present yourself matters. And that that, that includes like um, the language you use, like the way you dress and um, your attitudes towards things, like opinions that you express and things like that. Like people will remember like, oh, that's the person who, who like has this weird thought or like, <laughs> or, but you know, um, yeah, like even, I didn't really understand the concept of modesty until I, um, until I did theology of the body. Um, but yeah, that yeah, 
definitely like impressions last and people I remember people saying certain things about the way I dressed and stuff like that and um, yeah so um, number two have a plan for social situations before you enter them so um, like networking is a good thing right like if you like we're all going to be put in situations where you know you you might have to be in situations that involve alcohol or you know that you don't necessarily like want to be in or that sort of thing but you know it's always a good thing to network and build relationships and that sort of thing um it might just even be in the context of your own friendship groups and stuff um but of course like where there's alcohol involved there's always going to be social pressure so um i guess some of the things that i kind of figured out a bit later in the piece <laughs> was um plan to drive um and decide when you'll leave and then you can work out if, if you do want to have a drink or two you can work out how many you can have and then just stick to it um, and then also be strategic about who you talk to earlier on in the event because that's the time where people are probably more legit <laughs> you know um, you know I would never leave like if I wanted to talk to a particular partner or manager or something because you know I was trying to build a relationship with them I'd always try and make a beeline for them at the beginning because then I knew they were the ones who were going to leave early anyway because they have families but um yeah I guess it's just like a practical thing um and build relationships number three build relationships with those you encounter and let them get to know the whole you so I think someone mentioned this earlier when we were sharing but um yeah like I think we wouldn't necessarily want to just um you know launch off into this big bible bashing like rant like you need to become catholic because <laughs> we don't want you to go to hell um that's like never going to be a good basis of a you know relationship that's actually going to get someone to heaven like you know friendship is the key um and when you when people start to see you see that you're normal and likable and not like a crazy person um then they'll be more likely to be open to hearing your point of view um and you can have this, you know, back and forth kind of like respectfully. Um, so the witness of a friend can be really powerful. And I've experienced that in my own life. Like I always try and surround myself with people who are going to make me better. <laughs> um, and it brings me to number four. Surround yourself with like-minded people who will support you in your faith journey. So, um, you know... It's always easier to go with the crowd than be like the one person who's like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Like, you know, you have to make a stand. Um, so I'm not advocating for being a sheep and just following whatever other people do. But, but what I'm saying is that, um, you know, like if you have a group of friends who are Catholic and they're all like, let's go to mass, you know, that's a good thing to go with the crowd. Um, so, yeah. Um, and you also you don't really want like yes men kind of like surrounding you and everything that you say or do is like yeah that's right that's you know you do you that sort of thing like you want people who are going to call you on on like bad decisions that you make you know like for example if I had friends who were like um you know I told them oh, I'm going to go to this work event on Friday night and you know oh, it might turn out to be a big night or something and then if I had friends who were like oh that might not be a good idea how about you leave that at eight o'clock and we can go for a movie you know I would have been more likely to you know pick that option um that sort of yeah so um and then if you've got Catholic friends you can go to mass together go to adoration together go to Catholic events together you know you have a really fun time <laughs> and um and I've also noticed that relationships with Catholics always go deeper so I've got friends who I've had for decades like I'm not that old but you know like a long time <laughs> um you know like mostly my whole life and they're like those relationships, even though like we've got history, we've got, you know, all of that stuff. Um, and it's it's good, but you never really get deep, like, you know, in terms of sharing, because I don't know, I don't, you need to have that commonality in terms of the faith, I feel anyway, for me. Um, like, for example, like I met, we got introduced to this couple who, I think they moved here from Canada, um, just to, at the, you know, at the start of this year, we didn't know them. I just got a text from someone saying, oh, like, do you, would you be interested in making friends with this family? They don't know anybody. And then they turned up at our house, um, for, like we went for, we invited them for dinner. 
and it was like we just clicked like that it was you know because we had that foundation of the faith like everything else was just like you know just fell in you know I've noticed that every time I meet a Catholic in any scenario it's like oh you're Catholic like and you can actually like talk about things and yeah so that's um it's always a good thing um number five be a regular recipient of the sacraments they're really real graces that are available like in the Eucharist and confession and um just being with our Lord like in those intimate ways and I know personally like you know, even while I was in that whole party culture, like I was still attending mass and receiving the Eucharist and I was going to confession like regularly. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that that is the reason why I like the Catholic faith and God had like, you know, a little like claw in me. I was never, I never went too far and any, like I never touched drugs or any of that like sex stuff or anything like that. It was just like, I knew that there was like certain limits and I didn't want to get too far away from my faith even though I didn't understand it like that it was definitely grace that like pulled me back onto this track where I am now so yeah never give up on the sacraments um, number six always be prepared to defend the faith so this is what I was talking about before get to know the church teachings um, understand the arguments practice the arguments um, like think about play devil's advocate think about scenarios where people might ask you a certain thing if you bring something up and then think how you would answer it um, there are so many resources out there now and you know in this age of the internet there's no excuses for not knowing anything like if even if you're in the middle of an argument and you get caught off guard just like pretend to go to the toilet and like google the answer <laughs> <laughs> so yeah um, and then lastly um, be authentically catholic and um, one thing that Brendan Malone, um, I don't know if you guys know Brendan Malone, but um, he, he's a great speaker, um, he's, he said something in a talk like a few years ago that really stuck, to, stuck with me, um, and it was, he said, if being a Catholic was a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? So yeah, like I guess in this day and age, it's like, it's really easy to just like hide the fact that we're Catholic, um, but you know, like God is our everything. He's like, you know, he's gonna look at our life and see what we've achieved and that sort of thing. And like, if you love people, you want them to get to heaven with you. And so, you know, your witness and, you know, being Catholic is like a, it's a good thing. <laughs> and as Pope John Paul II says, be not afraid. Um, the very worst case, you lose, you lose a friend or two. Um, it's happened to me before, like close friends, they just defriended me on Facebook and because I've posted something about abortion or or the, you know, authentic definition of marriage. Um, if somebody is not willing to stick by you through having a difference of opinion, um, then they're not really worth having in your life anyway. So yeah, go out there and be Catholics in a 21st century. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you.